So yeah, it, it would seem that if, if a text wasn't in line with uh, a religion that it would fall out of use. But we're not just dealing with religion here, we're dealing with politics and the Yahwist has to work with what he has. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to the Murray Scriptura podcast, and today I'm going to be looking at a uh, episode from another podcast, actually, uh, the OnScript podcast with Matt Bates and Matt, I don't know the other Matt, I just call them the Matts, like the Bobs and Office Space, if you've ever seen that movie, but um, really good um really good podcast. Like I'm going to critique some, some things today, uh, from their interview that they did, but, uh, it's, it's not a critique against, um, I'm not trying to bash a podcast. It's a really good podcast. It's, so it's one of the better ones out there. So one of the purposes of doing this is to promote them and get you guys to listen to that podcast as well. Cause it's, uh, it's pretty good. So they interviewed this, uh, professor at Regent. Actually, he is, uh, Marshall Shepherd Professor, whatever that means, sounds impressive. Those uh, countries, uh, those UK related countries are, they have some weird names for professors. I know um, John Barclay, he's the Lightfoot Professor. I'm not sure what those uh, titles mean, but uh, they sound kind of cool. So anyway, um, the Mats did this interview with uh, Ian Proven. And so on the OnScript podcast, they talk about Ian's latest book, Discovering Genesis, Content Interpretation Reception. So I'm going to play some clips from that interview. Um, clips, some of the clips are a little long, but I want to give uh, some con- context to, to them as much as I can. But at the same time, I don't want to copy the whole OnScript uh, episode. So um, let's... T- Take a listen to the first clip. Um, I don't always find the history of interpretation terribly helpful. Um, for example, there's a bit of a tendency in both Jewish and Christian interpretation through history, a bit of a tendency to read biblical characters as heroic figures, heroically virtuous, for example. And, you know, quite a bit of that is quite implausible, it seems to me. Okay, yeah. So I agree with... Um with Ian on this in the sense that there's these character, character studies out there that try to make uh, biblical characters out better than what they actually are in the Bible. Um, but on the flip, flip side, there's also, um, there's also character studies out there that make them to be worse than what they uh, were originally intended to be. And so we took a look at this uh, during the Jacob cycle, uh, during that episode on this podcast, on the Murray Scriptura podcast, and saw that the Elois was really uh, promoting Jacob, trying to make him to be the good guy. Because uh, the reputation that he had out out there at the time was that he was uh, kind of a scoundrel. And so the Elois is responding to that and trying to fix Jacob's reputation. Now, the Yahwist comes along later and adds to that narrative, and then that's where we get, uh, that's where we get some of the bad, the, more of a bad side of Jacob. Uh, but the Yahwist has his uh, own agenda. So I agree with Ian in that, uh, yeah, we can get these biblical character studies off, uh, making them better than what they are, or vice versa. And in this case, I I disagree with Ian and and as far as the Elois goes, um, and that I mean he wasn't he wasn't he's not really taking that into account here. He's he's looking at the whole narrative, uh, which we're going to get to that whole discussion in a little bit here. But uh, just to say that the Elois, the Elois would not agree with <laughs> the Elois would not agree with Ian. All right, so in the next uh, clip, Ian's going to get into uh, his thoughts on the uh, different sources of uh, Genesis. And uh, also, I, f- I forgot to mention that um, you know this isn't this isn't a critique of, of of Ian's book. I haven't read his book, so this is this is about his comments. So uh, don't email me saying I should read his, his book before um, commenting. I'm just uh, you know I, I heard what he said, so I'm just responding to that. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, if you want to read the book, go ahead. I encourage you to buy the book. You have, you have what we call the final form of Genesis, but you also see the book has early stories that were collected together into meaningful groups and then edited further. And then those group, that body of literature was fronted by the prologue in, in, of Genesis 1 to 11, which itself seems to have been fronted by two creation stories. So, you know, when we look at the book of Genesis, it has a history of reception and redaction. So which part has communicative intent if if the book was received and re-envisioned um, through time? Well, that's one of the great central questions, I think, that modern biblical interpretation has, has had before it and has made it its concern to, to try to answer. Um, I don't set all of these things at odds with each other, though I'm rather of the opinion of Brevard Childs that is the final form, I think, from a, certainly from a Christian point of view, reading the Old Testament as scripture, I think it's the final form that is the fullest version of communicative intent. And uh, this gathers up, I think, all of the ongoing intent through the ages. And, and I don't see this as as deeply in conflict in, in some way. Um, so as you know, in this book and my other work, I rather, I'm not really terribly interested in questions of origins in a sense. I mean, they're interesting enough as questions in themselves, but I'm much more interested in, in trying to work out what the book of Genesis in the form we have it now means to say. And that's uh, not merely reducible to the role of this or that individual, Moses or whoever, in the formation of, of uh, parts of the book. Okay, so I just agree with Ian on on this. I think it's critical that you understand uh, the origins of of what's being written. Um, I think it's critical to know what each source was responding to, um, and you know, I mean, I get that Ian is is concerned about the overall gist of Genesis the overall final form. Uh, I can understand that, but that's like saying, you know, you, you're you concerned with the house, but not the the bricks or the roof or the shingles or the plumbing. Like those things make up the house. And so if you're going to try to study the Bible on a verse by verse level, it helps. It's going to, you're going to need to know uh, why uh, uh, they were written, and the the origins there are important. So, like I always I always say, the you can't understand the what fully without knowing the why, and so that's why mere reading is so important. Okay, so he's going to continue on this uh, line of thought. Um, what I mean by community of intent is the cumulative community of intent of human authors and, and tradents, the people who pass on the tradition, really. Um, and I see no reason to think that, that it, it's possible to take a cynical view of process as if what the later people do is wildly at odds with what the earlier people thought. And certainly there's quite a bit of modern biblical interpretation that has taken that cynical view. Um, I don't take that kind of view, nor do I find it particularly plausible, actually. Well, I do think that they're wildly at odds. Uh, not so much the, uh, you know, the Yahwist, the Deuteronomist, and the priestly sources. I mean, I, yeah, okay, they're kind of all on the same line from what I know of them. I haven't really studied them in depth. Uh, depth. But uh, the Eloist, no, he's uh, he's a lot different. Um I mean, he says there's less, Joseph has less less brothers, there's less commandments, there's seven commandments instead of ten, ten commandments. I mean, these are big differences. So somebody's, somebody's wrong. I mean, yeah, the Yahweh comes along later. And so at, at best, he's correcting the Elohist. At worst, he's uh, lying for political purposes. But I think we can get a better insight from the text by looking at what did the Elohist originally mean and then seeing how the Yahweh responds to it and seeing how they, how they interact together and how, uh, what, what the Yahweh is trying, trying to do there. 
But, uh, you know, again, most of the sources, I, I guess they're probably in line uh, with these exception of the Elohist, I think is different. There's a uh, anti-centralization um, uh, source uh, here and there. Um, from what I understand, I haven't really studied that source that much, but uh, kind of pushing against the centralization uh, of Jerusalem. So, you know, I think that's a significant difference as well. All right, so the next, uh, the next clip here is uh, kind of the same thought line. In what sense is it implausible? Because I, I, um, I think you're right that there is a, a strong tendency to, to, for biblical scholars, as they look at the redaction history of the text, to emphasize the degree to which each stage of the text represents a distinct theology and ideology and that then you have a sort of diversity of perspectives that are in some sense at odds with each other yeah i mean it seems to me though a, a, a rather implausible view of the way in which communities of faith deal with text and pass text on i mean it, it would seem to me that unless the text was thought to be continually speaking along the same general lines that it would simply fall out hmm. of use and, and become marginal the, the very fact that we have these texts presented to us in in what the final editors I think uh, could reasonably be expected to think was a coherent story um, uh, I, I find the the implicit view of the way tradition is passed on that's operative in some modern scholars minds just to be unconvincing okay so I think the key point here that Ian is is Ian is missing is that this is not so much about a community of faith. This is this is about political. This is about political propaganda, like I talk about in uh, the very first episode uh, on this podcast. So the the Yahwist is trying to integrate the northern tribes into the southern the southern tribes. They're tr trying to consolidate everyone. And so, in order to do that, he's not just going to reject a, re a, re a revered text in the northern tribes. He kind of commandeers that text and adds to it to in an integrative way, in a, in a way that respects the uh, northern tradition, but also integrates them into the south. So yeah, it, it would seem that if, if a text wasn't in line with uh, a religion that it would fall out of use. But we're not just dealing with religion here. We're dealing with politics and the Yahwist has to work with what he has. All right, so the next clip is going to be talking about uh, the curses in Genesis. And I really like, I really like Ian's views, views on these. So have a listen. Uh, first of all, you you talk about the woman's pain in childbearing, and and say that the pain as such is not new. So so the text actually says that her pain will be increased in childbearing, mm -hmm. and then also regarding thorns and thistles, you say they probably already existed, mm -hmm. but uh, rather this is a way of talking about a kind of barrenness in the land uh, at point. So 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 what is that? You know that that kind of uh, demythology, not demythology, is deromanticizes the the Garden of Eden um, as this perfect place, and uh, instead, uh, what does it mean if the Garden of Eden has pain in it and thorns and thistles? Well, indeed, which is a very profoundly important theological question, it seems to me. Um, I believe generally, just to step back for a minute, I believe that generally we have all too often imported Greek philosophical notions into our reading of the biblical story almost unconsciously. And so notions of perfection have entered in, and then we we fill the idea of perfection with our own content. So perfection must mean, must necessarily mean no pain and so on. And it, it leads to... Um, rather 
extraordinary views of, of how creation once was that when you actually read the scriptures, you don't get that impression, interestingly enough. Um, so I don't believe that the world being good in Genesis 1 means that it was perfect in those ways that I've just described. Yeah, so some, some really good points here by Ian. Uh, it echoes uh, a lot of my same views on the Genesis curses. Uh, I did an episode on my old podcast, the RE2 uh, podcast. I'll try to put a link to that in the show notes if you want to listen to that episode uh, where we talk about the the curses, not just the, um, the woman's curse, but Adam's. Uh, curse and the serpent's cu- curse and how they all have to do with fertility. The Yahweh source seems to be especially concerned with uh, fertility. Perhaps maybe he was he was they were battling other fertility gods at the at the time uh, for influence. So like uh, Baal, I think was or Baal was a uh, fertility god, I believe. So and that god shows up in the narrative a lot. Although I guess maybe not the Genesis narrative. I'm not uh, I'm not sure about that offhand, but um uh regardless, the theme there seems to be seems to do with fertility. Um and I yeah, I think it's I agree with Ian. I think it's a, a mistake to define perfection uh the way that uh, most people do. Okay, so this next clip uh they're going to be dealing with um the question of of some difficulties uh in in Genesis or even in the Old Testament, for that matter. And what do you consider the most troubling aspect of the Old Testament? What do you still wrestle with? Um, I, like many people again, I think the whole question of the level of violence, apparently divinely sanctioned violence, and the whole question of the necessity of that or the unavoidability of that. I mean, these are serious questions, particularly when you know the history of reception and you know that other people have quoted those texts to justify horrendous, horrendous behavior. Uh, it's right for us to, to wrestle with these questions. It's necessary for us to wrestle with these questions. Yeah, so that's a uh, that's a common concern. I think I've uh, f- uh, I asked N.T. Wright the same question uh, again on the, the old my old RE2 podcast, which I'll try to link to that to that as well. But he had the same uh, the same concern with those types of verses. But uh, as I talk about in the uh, Moses cycle episode of this podcast, it's. Um, you know, I, I think we can at least get an understanding as to why it was written. Uh, as far as the Amorites and the Moses cycle, the Alois was trying to prevent the Israelites from thinking that they had descended from from the from the Amorites, and so that would keep them part of the northern king, kingdom, keep them from defecting to one of the border uh, nations that were influencing them. So I, I mean, I think that's helpful. I mean, to to know to, to know the reason why it was written. Uh, I can't say for that f- for all the instances uh, in the Bible that was the reason, but uh, for the Eloist and the Moses cycle, uh, the text seems to support the idea that that's what the Eloist was was trying to do. But yeah, if you're looking for anyone who's looking to the Bible for morality for uh, God's character. These are difficult and challenging uh, types of verses to, to look at. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for listening.